The Latin root for intelligence is interlego. It's to choose between. Mm -hmm. That's what minds do. They choose between. And and in the in the most basic sense, information is choosing between, between a zero and a one, between a A or a C or a G or a T. And so what we find in life is stored information in DNA suggesting a prior act the prior activity of a mind in in choosing between the options to elect the one that's there present. The clip that we're about to watch is basically like a litmus test for your ability to move past cognitive dissonance and to consider the evidence whatever direction it might point. You might recognize Dr. Stephen Meyer from his recent appearances on Joe Rogan and also Pierce Morgan's Uncensored. I've also been honored to have him on this channel. He will also be in the Wisdom Society Book Club in case you're interested in that and getting a little FaceTime with Dr. Meyer. Click the link in the description. But in this video, we're going to watch Dr. Stephen Meyer and Jonathan Pajot Joe and the big thesis of this clip from this conversation that we're going to feature is that pure materialism is not sufficient at explaining the recent discoveries in science that are pointing more and more clearly to intelligence and to design and to dare I say intelligent design. Let's do it. Life and the universe are best explained by a designing intelligence rather than by undirected material processes such as in the biological realm natural selection acting on random variation so um and it's it's quite different from uh young earth creationism in that it is making no claims about the age of the earth most proponents of intelligent design think as i do that the earth is very old uh and but it's it's an age neutral proposition it's saying that life is designed as opposed to merely giving the appearance of design which is what many darwinian biologists say in fact that is classic Darwinianism. Uh, Richard Dawkins has said that biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a, a purpose. But the, the the claim that the the Darwinists make is that that the uh, appearance is an illusion, That uh, and it, it's an illusion because even though life looks as though it was designed, the, the appearance of design is a product of an unguided, undirected mechanism namely natural selection and uh, acting on random variation. So our, our, our challenge to the evolutionary establishment is not about the idea of change over time or about the idea of microevolution or adaptation. It's not even necessarily about the idea of universal common descent, the idea that all organisms are related by common ancestry, although I personally and other ID proponents are skeptical about that, others are not. But what we're really challenging is this idea that there's no evidence of actual design in life. The, the claim that life is the product of undirected processes such that the appearance of design is just an appearance, just an illusion. So our, our, we, we tie, named our theory intelligent design to contrast it with that idea of Darwinian apparent design. Hmm. Uh, now, so back to, to creationism, creationism and intelligent design are different in two ways. One, creationism is committed to a particular age of the earth and a particular reading of the days of Genesis uh, in, the, in the Bible. Uh, our theory is neutral about that, but most of us as scientists hold that the earth is very old. Uh, and secondly, the creationism is derivative from, or as is in a sense, a kind of a deduction or interpretation of a bit of the biblical text, whereas the theory of intelligent design is an inference from biological and astronomical and physical and cosmological data. It's a, it starts with the, the, the evidence and infers to the activity of a designing mind behind the evidence as a matter of scientific and philosophical reasoning. The intelligent design folks are not saying we don't know, therefore God, we're saying look at what we now do know that is coming to the surface in recent years as we look deeper and deeper into what exists inside of the cell and what exists inside of dna look at what we do know and now let's ask the question what does this tell us by the mid-1960s when this sequence hypothesis of Watson, uh, uh, francis crick is confirmed you, biology enters an information age and people realize that inside the cell, we don't just have chemical reactions going on. It's not just metabolism even. Mm -hmm. It's it's an information storage, transmission and processing system. Yeah. And if there's two different processing systems inside the cell, one for replicating DNA and one for using the information in DNA to direct the construction of proteins. And so the, the sophistication of the informational system that's at work inside even the simplest cell, even one-celled bacteria have information processing and storage capacity of the type I'm describing. 
This, this completely changes the terms of debate about the origin of life and even, even uh, evolutionary biology, because we now realize that in order to build uh, the first living cell and in order to build new life from pre-existing life, in each case, you have to have information. Just as in our computer world, you need code to produce, uh, to, to, if you want to give your computer a new function, if you want to have a new app or a new program or a new operating system, you've got to provide information. Same thing turns out to be true in life. If you want to build a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form, or if you want to build life in the first place, you've got to have information to build the proteins and the molecular machines and the other structures inside the cell. And so that's that creates a shift. It, it puts ev all evolutionary theories under pressure. Uh, I would say that, that both chemical and biological evolutionary theory have reached a state of impasse because they cannot explain the origin of information. And yet we know from experience that information always arises from a known source and that source is intelligence. Yeah, and, it, and in some ways we also have the experience of in, in the world of seeing constraint go beyond the natural, like just ba things banging against each other. And that is exactly the same thing. It's things like mind, things like will, things like purpose, all of these invisible patterns that constrain reality. Uh, uh, the I, ones I, that go beyond the, the way the you're natural. talking, Jonathan, that's exactly, you're talking like an, a, an engineer, uh, but to understand life today, you have to think like a design engineer to understand the universe. You have mm. to, those fine tuning parameters I was talking about in physics, those are nothing more than highly improbable constraints on what matter is allowed to do by the fundamental laws of nature. Um, and we find in order to move from all the possible ways of arranging matter that there are to the ways that manifest themselves in life, hmm. one constraint after another has to be applied to those that, that, that those huge ensembles of possibilities have to be narrowed to get something that we would recognize as life and that is that that um, well that makes life possible let's just say that yeah and so you know, the the engineering constraints that are necessary to produce a cell are immense uh, and highly improbable and they also represent inputs of information this was the basic insight of the uh, early information scientists like like uh, like Weaver and others uh, um, uh, the idea that information involves the the uh, re restriction of possibilities. In fact, we measure information today that way. If I flip a coin and it comes up head, well, let's do it with zeros and ones in the computer world. If I, if I get a one, I've eliminated a zero. So there are two possibilities. I've constrained the possibilities and elected one and eliminated another, and that's one bit of information. And so we, we, we now have a way of quantifying this idea of informational constraint. And the DNA is nothing more well it's a lot it's a lot of different things but it is also a a, a series of of restrictions you've got four mm -hmm. possibilities at each side along the dna molecule it's a, not a, a binary code but a quaternary code and so at each po point one of the four options is elected and three are eliminated and therefore a quantifiable amount of information is 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 imparted or stored at that point. And it turns out that that information is also importantly functional because it's directing the construction of the proteins and protein machines. Yeah, and I mean, what's fascinating to me is that even when I hear the Darwinian argument to say that it's it's just random mutation and then natural selection, it's like, what are, even, the, even the term natural selection, what exactly, so you're saying, so being has a tendency to persist and being has a tendency to be autopoetic and to constrain reality is in a manner that non-living beings do not have. And that type of constraint, even though we don't even necessarily have mind at the, at the outset, like at the lowest forms, but that type of constraint already looks like what mind does at a higher levels. And so, you know, like you said, like the idea of saying that we can notice that this type of constraint, even in the world of biology, is already there in the structures themselves. And and then, but then at some point thinking, well, then we can't go any further than that. Like we we notice that that actually does what it what we need, what we need for it to happen, for it to constrain reality in a way that goes beyond random, just randomness. Uh that that analog analogically you would be able to infer that then mind is an aspect of the universe that constrains matter 
Like this it already is, is in life. Like why does it bother really you? Really, a key insight you have that that um, I'm thinking back on on uh, Shannon, Claude Shannon, and uh, and Weaver who developed information theory in the first place. And the idea was that any reduction of uncertainty uh, is is results in a corresponding input of information. But and so that's a, what we can think of in the, the idea of imparting information is also a way of constraining things. But what we also know from our experience, our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, is that uh, if we have a big input of information into a system, it's always come from a mind, whether we're mm -hmm. talking about a computer program or a paragraph in a book or a, her a hieroglyphic inscription, or we're transmitting information now across the internet. Um, and so, but where does that information come from? It comes from a mind. And that kind of makes sense when you think of, or in, from intelligence. Well, what is the, the, the Latin root for intelligence is interlego. It's to choose between. Mm -hmm. That's what minds do. They choose between. And, and in the, in the most basic sense, information is choosing between, between a zero and a one, between a A or a C or a G or a T. And so what we find in life is stored information in DNA suggesting a prior act, the prior activity of a mind in in choosing between the options to elect the one that's there present. For some reason, I can't help but think of this analogy where a group of astronauts arrive at a distant planet in a galaxy far, far away. And on the shore of the beach there, they see letters that say, there is life on this planet. The life that is here is intelligent. You must know that we exist and we have a message to communicate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the astronauts go, look at this. There's no evidence for anything of intelligence or of life here on this planet. But look at this beautifully intricate pattern that has emerged on the beach. Now, I know this is not a perfect analogy on a number of levels, but I do think that it highlights the point that there is an absurdity in looking at information and calling it pattern, looking at linguistic information and saying that it is not a byproduct of intelligence. I hope that you guys can see that. I hope that that makes some sense. Check this out. It's called the Wisdom Society. And what it is, is a growing community of believers from around the world. We meet weekly, discuss tough questions, read scripture, pray. There's also a book club where we are joined by the author of the book so that we can discuss the book directly with the author. We have Paul Copan, Stephen Meyer, Jay Warner Wallace, Hugh Ross, and other experts that you've seen on this channel in that book club. I'm trying to connect the experts with you guys in a more intimate capacity. This just launched. It's currently less than a dollar a day for access to everything. I've put a ton of time and resources into building this. So join today, support the channel, invest in yourself, grow in faith, connect with believers from around the world and the experts that you see on this channel. I hope this is a huge blessing to you guys. I hope it's a no brainer to join based on the way that it's structured. And I hope to meet you there inside of the Wisdom Society.